Um, thank you, Kayla, for the introduction. Um, are you guys hearing me in the back? Okay. If I don't talk loud enough, just tell me. Um, as Kayla said, my name is Will uh, Tarpe. I've been at Stanford about five years. So uh, my milestone for this year is that my first PhD students are graduating soon. Um, Our first defense is on December 8th. So that's like three weeks from today. I was just talking with my uh, student, Anita, who's uh, feverishly preparing her dissertation slides. And, uh, and her uh, defense as well. So um, now is a really exciting time for me to present what we've been up to for um, the past length of a PhD or so. Um, and so I'm going to talk today about uh, my group's work in what we call electrochemical wastewater refining. But broadly speaking, we're trying to pull together or connect chemical manufacturing with wastewater treatment and do that in a way that is energy efficient and potentially energy positive. So our connections to energy, you'll see them and I'll kind of pull them out to highlight uh, for you. But in short, we're a group of mainly chemical and environmental engineers, we work across length scales. Um, and I think anything in energy systems requires work a lot uh, across length scales, right? So for those of you who are more on the molecular side, you'll see some of that. For those of you who are more on the systems, life cycle assessment, TEA, uh, techno-economic analysis, you'll see some of that as well. We love to kind of cross between those length scales because I think that's where the most interesting insights and impactful insights are. So a little bit about me. Um, I start with this photo because it's both about wastewater and about me. Um, this is the wastewater treatment plant uh, in uh, Southeast Washington, DC. Um, I grew up just across the river at the top of this picture in a town called Alexandria, Virginia that looks right at DC. So I could see the capital from my house. We lived on a, on a hill. Um, and this was a beautiful place for me to grow up. It was a wonderfully diverse place. And it was a place that I could explore being um, a scientist. Um, so I went to K through 12 uh, in uh, Alexandria. And then I came here to California. I just think it's my second time ever in California when I stepped foot on Stanford campus. Um, I decided to come to California because I didn't like winter and I heard that uh, <laughs> people did exciting things in the Bay Area. But I, that, was, that was really it. That was what motivated me to apply to a few California schools. Um, and uh, I spent four years at Stanford as a chemical engineer. I minored in African studies. So I've always been interested in how to take uh, chemistry and solve what we might call today applied or practical problems or real world problems. So, um, UC Berkeley started a program when I was a second year uh, PhD student called Development Engineering uh, that was really focused and is really focused uh, on um, using engineering approaches to solve very multifaceted problems. So my problem of interest was global sanitation. So I'll show you a little bit of work on that today, but happy to answer more questions about it. So um, when I was an undergrad at Stanford, I was always looking for ways to combine engineering, which I love, and chemistry, which I love, with kind of real people's real world problems. And so You'll see that approach kind of show up uh, throughout my work now, but in many ways, what I do now is an amalgamation of the things I thought were disparate when I was an undergrad, but turns out you can combine them just fine. Um, so as a PhD student, I worked with Cara Nelson, who actually is a UC Davis alum. Uh, so I've been to Davis a couple of times and know a few people in civil and environmental engineering here. Um, and I quote unquote switched disciplines from chemical engineering as an undergrad to environmental engineering as a grad student, and now I'm back in chemical engineering. Okay. And I have a courtesy appointment in environmental engineering. So to me, they're not that different. There are some use cases that are different, but and there are some um, historical reasons that chemical engineering and environmental engineering are different. But I think at their core, there's a lot more in common than there is uh, different between how chemical engineers and environmental engineers see the world. Um, so yeah, I spent five years at Berkeley. Um, I was one of the first development engineering graduate students. That was just a timeliness thing. Like I happened to be there when I started the program. Um, and then I went to Michigan for one year as a postdoc. Uh, I worked in civil and environmental engineering there. And then I came back to California uh, to be at Stanford, which is my undergraduate institution. So it does feel like home to me in many ways, but life is very different as a professor versus an undergraduate, as you can imagine. So I learned a lot more about the institution in my past five years uh, than in the past uh, lots of years since I first set foot on Stanford campus. But that's a little bit about me. Um, and now we'll dive into some of the work on electrochemical wastewater refining. So I like to start um, this kind of thesis of electrochemical wastewater refining from a framework, the planetary boundaries framework. Who's heard of the planetary boundaries framework? Some people, about half the room or so, third of the room. Um, and so this is a useful, one useful framework. It's not like the most useful framework, but it's one useful framework just to parse how humans are doing in terms of what the Earth, what the planet can handle. So you can look at this as like a series of pie charts, if you will. And there are different pieces of the pie, right? There's different categories like ocean acidification or biogeochemical flows. And that's where we're focused today, nitrogen and phosphorus. And then the colors and the radii of these uh, pieces of the pie 
tell us how in bounds we are, right? So planetary boundaries are in short, what can the planet handle in that category, right? Like how much climate change can the planet handle? So if you're green or in the inner circle here, this inner dotted circle, we're doing okay, we're below the boundary. If you're orange, we're, we're far outside of uncertainty or we're high risk, right? And so some of the work we do is focus on nitrogen and phosphorus because these cycles are some that we have drastically changed as a society. Um, and so there's plenty of room for innovation here. So as a kind of philosophy, I think a lot about what pollution is. And sometimes as a group, we talk about what does it mean to make pollution obsolete? What does a world look like where pollution doesn't exist, right? Um, another way to think about this is in biological systems, the idea of waste is kind of anathema, right? Like um, one organism's waste, to put it pithily, is another organism's food source, right? There's not like, there's not a concept of waste that just sits in the environment, linear discharges of waste in biological systems. But in our human industrial systems, there certainly are things we call waste, right? So if we can sort of um, resituate pollutants, uh, they may become products. And so I think what we do is new, but it's also old. So this is a quote from R. Buckminster Fuller from let's say the late 20th century. Um, but uh, in short, what he's getting at is that um, pollution is all about the place that a compound is. A compound like ammonia, which I'll talk about at length today, is a pollutant in some waters. It, it can lead to harmful algal blooms that lead to fish kills, etc. But ammonia is also a very core uh, component of fertilizer that feeds over half the world. Right? Same compound, different situations. In one, we call it a pollutant. In one, we call it a product. With that in mind, then if we can resituate pollutants, we, have, we can make them products right? through chemical transformation and chemical separation. So that's sort of the backdrop of how we think about this problem. So I'm going to talk about two stories today. One is about nitrogen and one is about lithium. Both are energy relevant, um, and I'll kind of make that clear, and then we'll dive into each chapter, but I'll start with some, some background and introduction. So the nitrogen cycle is one that chemical engineers have been very involved with uh, through the Haber-Bosch fertilizer production process. Um, but it's, it's far overdue for a redesign for this current century in the 21st century. So if we look at the natural nitrogen cycle, and this is based off of uh, work from many people, but especially uh, Jim Galloway, who's an environmental scientist, um, we cycle nitrogen between inert dinitrogen, the majority of the air we breathe, and reactive nitrogen, which is how we refer to all the other forms of nitrogen. We'll focus on ammonium and nitrate, these first two in particular. So this is a well-balanced cycle, but what humans have done is we've skewed this cycle. We've, well, we've done two things. First is we've doubled the throughput of nitrogen that goes through the environment, more than doubled it. So our anthropogenic nitrogen cycle is, has more nitrogen flowing through it than the natural nitrogen cycle. And second, we've skewed this cycle towards reactive nitrogen rather than inert nitrogen. So what that means is we have this net linear discharge of reactive nitrogen into the environment. And that's largely due to the Haber-Bosch process, which um, is not something, I always tell my chemical engineers, it's not something necessarily to vilify because it solved the problem of last century. Right. At the, 100 years ago, the big challenge was how to feed a growing population, and we solved that problem. As we so often do as engineers, we introduced another problem, which is how to sustain humanity in the environment. And so that's our goal now, and we, we are really part of that solution. Uh, broadly speaking, as chemical engineers, we can be part of that solution. And so the, the balance to the Haber-Bosch process here is wastewater treatment plant nutrient removal, right? converting these reactive nitrogen species of water back into nitrogen gas. We have the technology to do this, biological nitrification, denitrification for the environmental engineers in the room, but it's not done on, uh, worldwide, right? It's not, it's not broad enough to make a huge dent in these, in these numbers. So there's a, a, a role here for recycling this reactive nitrogen in place. Even if we could go through this cycle and, well, and balance it well here, would we want to spend all of the energy associated with doing this and then doing a reverse process and using inert nitrogen as an intermediate? Maybe not. Maybe that's not the most energy efficient way to do it. So a little bit more about nitrogen. Of course, there are environmental challenges. These are some of the harmful algal blooms I was talking about earlier. This is in the Great Lakes, uh, in the Lake Erie in particular. And uh, we have hundreds of tons of, of megatons, excuse me, of nitrogen uh, being discharged into the environment. This is largely because 80% of wastewater worldwide is not treated before discharge. This is a hard number for us to believe because in the US, that number is much lower. Um, but that's a staggering number. Like that's teraliters, uh, 10 to the 12th liters of water every every uh, every day going into the environment that is polluted and is literally experiences no treatment before it's discharged. Okay. When we're making ammonia fertilizers, we also emit CO2, right? Some people argue that Haber-Bosch is an ammonia production process. It is also a CO2 production process. Um, on, a, on a mass to mass uh, ratio, more CO2 is made than ammonia from Haber-Bosch. 
Now, an under, I think an underappreciated uh, challenge associated with Haber-Bosch production conventional nitrogen management is equity. So we can think about um, how many Haber-Bosch fertilizer production plants there are in the world. That number is around 100. To me, that seems low. Like that's a, that's a small number to feed the entire population. There are 100 facilities where fertilizer is made. That's quite a marvel, right? These are centralized, huge facilities. And also another thing associated with that is that these are not equitably distributed, let alone by population, right? There are several in North America. There are very few in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. So what that means is that fertilizer has to be transported very long distances for some people, but very short distances for other people. And so what that, what that leads to is people far from these black dots that are Haber-Bosch fertilizer production facilities, they can pay up to twice or more uh, the price for fertilizer per mass of nitrogen even though their annual income GDP here is much less. So this is an equity issue. And it's also a challenge for all of us because we all pay the price of transporting fertilizer for long distances, right? The price in uh, CO2 emissions in particular. So there's some, some um, room here for on-site ammonia manufacturing, right? That can be potentially more energy efficient if you can run the process at a smaller scale and closer to the point of use. So wastewater is sort of our medium of choice as, it, as you will. Um, and our wastewater nitrogen can substantially offset the kind of conventional fertilizer, Haber Bosch is what's uh, hidden there. So, just from a mass balance perspective, we can look at in green here over time. Uh, these are the amount of nitrogen in two major wastewaters municipal wastewater, so when we flush our toilets, at our houses, at our offices, et cetera, it goes to a municipal wastewater treatment plant. And the second wastewater is fertilizer runoff. When fields are fertilized, there's going to be nitrogen uh, coming out of uh, that uh, fertilizer runoff. And so we can just kind of do green over purple here over several years. We can get around 30% of total fertilizer production offset from wastewater. Now, this number to me is like, awesome, let's keep going. It's not 100%. I wasn't thinking it would be before we did this analysis. But 30% of the huge numbers that we're talking about is quite considerable. Another thing we can think about is should we focus on ammonia or nitrate? So here, TAN refers to total ammonia nitrate, which is just a way of summing up two forms of ammonia, NH3 ammonia proper and ammonium NH4 plus. We'll get into that more later, but the sum of those is total ammonia nitrogen. So you can see here, if we're looking at concentration versus different wastewaters, in short, nitrate uh, sources are uh, lower concentration than ammonia sources. But what I'm not showing you is the volume difference. There's more of these nitrate-laden wastewaters than ammonia-laden wastewaters. So with the question of should we focus on treating ammonia or treating nitrate, my answer is both, right? Because if you take that flow, the flow rates times the concentrations, you get around the same number of nitrogen in these two sources, so to speak, nitrate laden and uh, ammonia laden. Um, so there's opportunities to focus on both ammonia and nitrate pollutants. We don't need to decide or prioritize either one right now. So that's a little bit on nitrogen. Now I'll skip to lithium, but you'll see that the nitrogen uh, motivation is, is, is not explicitly, not uh, exclusively, but it's predominantly environmental, right? Most of the things I told you were environmental reasons why we should recycle nitrogen from wastewater. Lithium to me is a fascinating case because it's a bit of a foil, right? Um, it's more economically driven than environmentally driven. And a lot of that just has to do with the available literature. We know a lot more about nitrogen pollution in the environment than we know about lithium pollution in the environment. However, there's a huge economic driver to have lithium, particularly for lithium ion batteries. Um, I've spent 10 years trying to convince people that ammonia could be cost effective to recover from wastewater. It took me 10 minutes to <laughs> convince people that lithium was economically worthwhile. But what we're missing on the lithium side is the, uh, that environmental case. What's the pollution problem that we're solving with lithium, right? And some of these other um, transition metals. So it's an interesting foil and it's made me really think about how we approach uh, our work because in some cases we lead with the economic case and the environmental case is still developing. And in other cases, we do the exact opposite. So here, um, for ion selective separations with a focus on lithium, again, we're just tracing out kind of our linear economy, right? We take in conventional resources, we make useful products, we use them, we dispose them, we deem them as waste, and then we discharge them as waste into the environment. These, there are plenty of linear economy challenges. Um, they're all around us. We don't need to go into detail too much about those, but happy to talk more about them as it applies to uh, you all's research as well. But what we're doing with ion selective separations, if we can achieve this goal of making a separation process that can just pick out one type of ion, right? If we can separate lithium from all of the other components of the lithium ion battery, right? Then we could do something that actually circularizes this and turns from waste products and even unconventional water sources that are underused and also treated as waste products 
And if we can separate out just the ion we want, then we can close this loop to manufacturing. So let's make this concrete for the lithium case, okay? We'll fill this in and say, okay, the conventional resources are ores and continental brands. That's how lithium is made today, largely mining and also from salt lakes or sailors. Okay, the waste products would recycled. The rest end up in landfills. Okay, um, but if you want to, I'll show you these steps, but just them. And then there was, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's an acidic wastewater. I'm good. Like I'm on my home turf. Another area here is oil and gas produced water, Brian. So this is of, of high interest. I think Exxon just like this week was announcing that they're going to be trying to produce lithium ion batteries from their produced water. Um, and so with either of these sources, we could do ion selective separations to separate out just the lithium and basically make a battery precursor, like lithium carbonate that original, um, that OEMs now buy to make batteries. But our goal is always to make a, a waste derived uh, product that's indistinguishable from what you would buy off the shelf, right? That's kind of how we're, what's our thesis on how to drive behavior change or market change. So this lithium demand to quantify it a bit, we can look at several um, scenarios here, but in short, we can look at the lithium supply. And importantly, this is like this decade. Lithium is really driven home for me how urgent um, these, these uh, trends are, right? A lot of times I find myself thinking about 2050 or like toward the end of my career, but this is like, these are problems we need to solve in the next like, seven years, right? Um, uh, and so the lithium supply, so this is lithium carbonate equivalents. It's just how we measure lithium because lithium carbonate is the product of interest. We're around 0.4 megatons per year of a supply as of 2020. But where we need to get to in terms of the shortage, we're going to have a 1.8 megaton shortage annually per year. So if we were just trying to mine more, we would have to find a lot more mines. Sure, they exist, but we'd be using lower quality rock and thus more energy intensive extraction methods. If instead, or in addition, we look at some of these non-traditional sources in oil field brines, there's enough lithium if we could just recover it all from oil brines to meet our shortage, right? There's almost enough lithium from our current production of lithium ion batteries, which we know is going to increase or already is increasing, right? These sources are the right order of magnitude for solving the problem. Okay, so that's nitrogen and lithium. Let me dig a little into kind of our, our theory and our fundamentals of how we approach this. So when we say wastewater refining, what we mean in particular by that is making a tunable portfolio of products from wastewaters. So, and tunable is important here. I want to be able to turn knobs basically on my processes to say, do you want lithium carbonate? I can do that. Do you want lithium hydroxide? I can do that, right? Same thing for nitrogen, same thing for phosphorus. So to do that, we need to have sort of a working encyclopedia of different wastewaters and their compositions, right? We need to have a map of what wastewater looks like. So this is our attempt at this map from a perspective paper we published earlier this year. Um, each of the pies you see here is a wastewater, and then uh, there's some more information in there as well. So the placement of the pies ties into how much of each wastewater there is. So these are quite voluminous wastewaters. These are not as voluminous wastewaters. And then we have total dissolved solids, TDS for the environmental engineers and the water treatment folks, but that's just how many solids are in, in the water, right? If you dried out all the water, what would be left, okay? So in short, this is a, a bulk measure of concentration. More concentrated here, less concentrated here on the y-axis. Now we can look at the size of each pie, and each pie is related, that size is related to the value in billions of dollars that's in that wastewater. We get that value from the concentrations of the different components and their commodity prices. Right? So we've added that up and approximated the value. Speaking of concentrations, that's what the pieces of the pie are, the colors are. So why is this useful? This is useful for many reasons, but a use case would be, say I have a technology that can recover nitrogen, I think it can recover nitrogen from wastewater. I would want to know which wastewaters I should focus on, which wastewaters are gonna put me at a starting line ahead of time, right? And we can see this, it's just this bright green color. The colors are a little off, sorry, here, but hydrolyzed urine, maybe you didn't know that hydrolyzed urine is a great place to go. Now you do, as you see this map. Um, unless you're a urine enthusiast like me. <laughs> I acknowledge that that's not, maybe not the case. Okay, but um, you might also say fertilizer runoff or maybe municipal wastewater, but now we have a map on how to go about prioritizing different wastewaters. 
So when we say electrochemical wastewater refining, of course, we're using uh, electrochemical potential as a driving force. And so we've made sort of roadmaps of where we are in terms of these, uh, the, the, inner, um, the inner area here means someone has been able to make electrochemically a product of interest, but usually in a nice controlled environment with a very simple solution. Awesome, but not all the way there, right? We want to see it done in real wastewater, separate out a pure product from a very dirty mixture of wastewater. That's what the blue is. So uh, the, the, the broader this area, or the higher this area, the more progress we've made on this element. Okay, so nitrogen, we've made some progress on lithium, phosphorus, we've done this for other elements as well. So that's kind of our, how we think about this problem. So I've said separations a lot, but I just want to emphasize what that is because it's sort of chemical engineering language. Um, but when we say separations, we mean purifying products most of the time. So um, in chemical manufacturing, we need to make products via catalysis often reaction driven approaches. But if you, most reactions will make a mixture of products, right? The, the harder part or a hard part that is often understudied is how to separate out the product you want, right? No one is buying, when you go to buy medicine, you don't want a mixture of medicines. You want a 99% pure medicine. That's where the value is, right? Same thing um, here. So in terms of energy consumption, in this industrial case, separations alone are about 40 to 50% of the energy consumption of US chemical manufacturing, but most of us wouldn't point to that. We'd say, oh, it's that high, high temperature catalyst we need to use, or that, that, that is true, but purifying products to the purity that we need is a huge challenge uh, and costs a lot of energy. So what separations people like myself have been doing is trying to move down to lower energy forms of separating components from one another. Most of what we do has to do with boiling things away, right? Drying, evaporation, distillation, those are high energy ways to do things, or even pressure driven vacuum approaches. Now we're trying to look at lower energy ways to achieve the same separations as a way to reduce the overall energy footprint uh, of the US chemical manufacturing system. Okay, so um, we talk a lot about reactive separations and we just mean if there's catalysis or reaction and there's separations, purification, we need to do multiple steps if we're trying to take an impure uh, dilute feedstock and turn it into a very pure concentrated product. Okay. So what that means is that if we're looking at different contaminants, we need to have at least three steps. We need to capture or concentrate the reactant in the wastewater. We need to turn it into something, and then we need to purify the product, right? Sounds very simple, but what we're after is kind of processes that do more than one of these steps. So a process that does both capture and conversion, right? CO2 capture and conversion is a great example of that. Or a process that does reaction and purification. Also, you show you some approaches where we convert nitrate into ammonia, and then purify that ammonia to a very high level, and it happened to come from wastewater. Okay. So in terms of uh, how we do all of this, uh, we use the term electrochemical wastewater refineries. And as chemical engineers, we use that word like very intentionally. Like I drove past the Richmond refinery, which apparently has changed ownership. It's not, it's not Chevron anymore. It's had 76 on it. Yeah. I don't follow mm -hmm. these things as much, yeah. but yeah. You have the big like uh, yeah. sticker on one of like yeah, the I saw drums. That. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I don't feel like, is yeah. that all of them or just one of Indeed. them? Indeed, <laughs> maybe just one. Uh, <laughs> but um, when we think about a refinery, what a refinery does at its core is it takes in a crude feedstock, crude oil, that may change in composition day to day and certainly changes with, uh, place by place. And we have dozens of unit processes that many chemical engineers have worked on that allow us to make dozens of products, right? We can make different types of plastics, different types of fuels. Um, but we have this whole amalgamation of processes that we can tune, tunable portfolio of products, right? That's what we're after. And so we're trying to do that, but use wastewater instead of crude oil as our feedstock, right? But to do that, we need to really understand what's in the wastewater and be able to command a battery of technologies that can really help us um, uh, achieve our goals. So we kind of separate these into three buckets, electric catalysis, using electrons to drive oxidation and reduction reactions, electrochemical separations, and I'll start here today um, with the first story on lithium selective membranes, so membranes and adsorbents here. And then this mouthful of stoichiometric electrochemical conversions is just our most accurate way of saying reactions that are not quite catalytic. So an example would be, those of you familiar with water splitting or water electrolysis, that produces hydrogen and oxygen. It also produces uh, hydroxide ions when you make hydrogen and protons when you make oxygen. Those hydroxide ions and protons we can use to run other reactions, but it's not catalytic because they're consumed. So that would be the case here. So we can use, in short, electrochemically produced acid and base to replace conventionally produced acid and bases. That's what we could come up with a better term for that, but that's what it's doing. Okay. So um, why electrochemistry uh, for wastewater treatment? It's modular, it's quite flexible scale. Some of our reactors fit between my fingers. 
some of the reactors that we're trying to build are like as tall as this room. Um, but of course, they can use the same uh, fundamental chemistry, physics, and math. We can integrate them with renewable energy. So I have, I'll show you one of my mechanical engineering students is actually pairing some of our water treatment techniques with solar panels outdoors to see if we can do that for on-site ammonia manufacturing. Facile process control, all we have to do is control current, which is the rate of an electrochemical reaction, or voltage, which is the driving force. Those are the two knobs, and we can change a lot just by having those two knobs. And then we can replace chemical inputs with electricity. So when I say a tunable portfolio, let's just take nitrogen. What I mean is we should be able to make different oxidation states, different physical states, solid liquid gas, different ionic and covalent bonds. Why can't we make something like acetonitrile from wastewater, right? Something with carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen bonds as well. Maybe we can make these building blocks. And then product purity. But I've talked about how higher you pay our higher purity products tend to be higher value. So our approaches to this are really organized around three um, kind of subgroupings, but we cross these boundaries all the time to the extent that maybe these aren't that useful, but I find it useful for people outside of our group to understand what we do. We design selective materials, which will be the first um, lithium story I tell you today. We make new electrochemical processes. Again, these unit processes that we can tune uh, that are electrochemically driven. And then we do a fair amount of work that is outside of the lab, whether that's scaling up technologies for work at wastewater treatment plants here in, in California, whether it's uh, some of our work on global sanitation in Kenya, Senegal, South Africa, but we're trying to not just design things that we think are useful, but actually get input from communities to tell us uh, what they think is useful and impactful as well. So let's dive into lithium. Um, and we're doing questions at the end, or should we pause? Um, okay, um, maybe we can pause quickly if anyone has a quick question before we dive into the lithium story. Yeah, please. Um, question about the lithium or the ion selective separation. Mm -hmm. um, do you do anything with the ions that don't get selected or do you use everything up in some other process? Yeah, great question. We tend to, I'll show you in the lithium case, we tend to focus on one ion at a time, but with the vision that you could stack these processes, right? You could have a process that gets the lithium out, then a process that gets the cobalt out, then one that gets the nickel out. So you need to stack them in series often to completely valorize, get all, squeeze all the value out of a given waste product. Um, so I'm not a chemical engineer, nor am I an environmental engineer. That's fine. So. I still talk to people like that. Yeah, yeah but yeah. so this might be like a self-evident like question yeah. for those folks who are. But my what, like intuitively, when you're thinking about scaling up production of a chemical, mm -hmm. whatever that chemical is, <laughs> like in order to achieve like a low cost mm -hmm. you know, per unit. It, the process needs to be specific to producing that chemical, right? Often. Often. So then if you have processes like in your fireside where you say we can tune it for different things, mm -hmm. how do you scale up that tunability to deliver to the economies of scale that you might see with current <clears throat> pardon me, chemical production processes yeah. that are more hyper specific and therefore tuned to that specific thing and really, really tightly integrated. Mm -hmm. Great question. So yeah, there is an underlying logic of economies of scale right? yeah. to, to summarize like that. Uh, when you make more, it gets cheaper per unit, right? Uh, but I think in chemical manufacturing, what we don't account for is transport, right? So you might make, it might be cheaper to make it in centralized facilities, it probably is. But what, if we're not accounting for the transport to go to where it needs to go, and accounting for the transport of the waste products, of the waste, sorry, to being treated as well. So what we're trying to beat is often a sum of two processes. Mm -hmm. So for the nitrogen case, where I've talked a lot about fertilizer production, but we need to add, because we have two values, value propositions, if we want to use kind of entrepreneurship language, we're treating wastewater and we're making a fertilizer. Okay. So we're doing two functions at once. So that, that, that thesis is where you're going to be able to meet it, mm -hmm. right? Because you have to think of how much money we spend on wastewater treatment and how much money we spend on reducing ammonia. Mm -hmm. Together, we can usually get just the beef. That's some of two things because we're doing two things at once. Okay. Yeah, sure. Even the with the tunability of producing different products at the end of it, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yeah. 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 Especially when, I guess, another way to think about it is how how refineries have been built over time is very. Um, almost like Frankenstein, uh, like oil and gas refineries weren't made to produce high purity plastics when they were first made. They were, they were made to, make, to use coal and make fuel, 
And then we said, oh, okay, now we can add something else. So they've been made in sort of generations. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing can happen and likely will happen with our race, water, and race. First, we'll focus on a core set of products, then we start adding things on. Okay, cool. Well, we'll keep diving in and then uh, we'll pause along the way to uh, a few questions because we have plenty of time. So I'm going to start the lithium story with kind of where we started. I'm going to tell it in chronological order, which doesn't always happen. Um, but we started to get into lithium battery recycling with a life cycle assessment. Okay, so we did that because I candidly didn't know much about lithium ion battery recycling. And I thought, let's get our, get our wits about us and think about what the, the most important problem to solve are. So we worked with a company called Redwood Materials, which is based in Nevada. Uh, it was started by a former Tesla employee and Stanford alum, J.B. Strobel. And their goal was to recycle uh, Tesla batteries. That's what they, what they started out as, but it became lots of lithium ion batteries. So uh, the questions we came up with together were, started quite simple, but got more complex. But in short, it was, let's compare conventional uh, uh, making, manufacturing of battery precursor materials to circular. Um, battery precursor materials or recycling. And so to do this, any good life cycle assessment needs a very clear accounting, right, and staging. So we split this up into three stages that are in all caps here. We need to extract uh, our raw materials. Then we need to have logistics of transporting either mined concentrate or uh, uh, spent batteries. And then we need to do the refinement. And that's where we focus most of our work on, either uh, refining um, kind of raw, raw-ish minerals into battery precursors, or actually recycling batteries, spent batteries into battery precursor materials. Yeah. Where we started this with some of these scorecards was we wanted to just like get a sense of, for different elements, so lithium, nickel, manganese, copper, aluminum, and cobalt, um, how far um, an atom of uh, each of these elements tends to travel from mine to producer. And it is staggering because to the point about like kind of Frankensteining things together, um, different countries specialize in different parts of the battery manufacturing chain. Some are good at mining, right? But then those raw materials need to go to another continent often to be refined. Yeah, China is a, is a huge part of this. Australia and uh, there are parts of, of Africa, including uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo where the mining happens. And then they actually need to get turned into batteries, right? But they're traveling so far to do this. And so this is where the transport costs really start to, to stagger, uh, or start to uh, get staggering. Okay, so to do this life cycle assessment, we needed to focus on what's called a functional unit, which is just a basis for a life cycle assessment. You can compare this on massive batteries. You could compare it on energy embedded in the batteries, etc. We decided to focus on two compositions that are quite common. NCA, which just stands for nickel, cobalt, aluminum, and NMC, nickel, manganese, cobalt. So these are the compositions, but this is just to say this is how we went about organizing ourselves. Okay, so our goal here was to address these two knowledge gaps about um, current recycling methods and how they compare uh, to conventional cases because so many companies are trying to do battery recycling now, but there's not a clear landscape of what battery recycling technologies there are. So we've talked to easily a dozen companies who are like, we're building a battery recycling pilot plant. And we're like, cool, how are you deciding what to put in it? And they're like, we just found stuff. Like we just found processes and we're scaling them up. Right? But not necessarily, and it's because they have to move fast. There's nothing against them, but that to me says there's a rule here for an informed, more informed design here that actually takes into account rigorous accounting for environmental impacts. So our inputs here were battery feedstocks and all the input consumables, the chemicals, energy, etc. And the outputs are the product we want to make and the unwanted emissions as well. So this is just another image of the, what I just showed, but it gets a little more granular. So when we say gate to gate, what we just mean is like at the refining facility. So that just means like coming into the gate of the refining facility and going out of the refining facility. So that was one part of the analysis we did and then cradle to gate accounts for the whole life cycle from the mining all the way to the produced product. So what we did is compared energy consumption, CO2 emissions and water, water use for several cases. I won't go into all of them, but we'll just give you a sense of what's happening here. So I mentioned some of these steps before. Hydrometallurgy is the acid leaching, right? It's the water-based um, uh, recycling processes. Mechanicals, when you separate out the different parts, like mechanically separate out the parts. And this RC is reductive calcination. This is a process that Redwood has developed, but is an adapted version of pyrometallurgy, right? So it's basically a lower energy version of combustion. Um, and so what we can see is some of the uh, decreases in energy consumption associated with uh, some of these different processes. So this is the conventional mine case. We have a recycled uh, battery, um, uh, generally like in literature, and then we have what Redwood was doing. And you can see their processes are indeed 
lower um, in energy consumption. We can also see the same thing for emissions, the same, same concept here on the x-axis, but just different y-axis here. So for emissions, we get <laughs> up to an 80% reduction and for water consumption, around 80 to 90% reduction. So this was interesting, but not the most surprising part to me. I think if I didn't tell you anything and asked you, is recycling more environmentally friendly at that point? You would have been like, yes, right. But now we have numbers, okay, cool. Here's an, an even more interesting part of the study to me. And I think life cycle assessments have kind of two purposes, and we tend to focus on the comparative one first, like which technology is better, the new one or the old one, right? Or these two new ones, which one is better? I think an understudied aspect of life cycle assessments or an underappreciated one is actually prioritizing how to optimize a new technology. So to put that another way, we might focus first on are these bars lower than this bar, right? That's one function of life cycle assessment. But another insight that I pull from this graph is within these bars, what's the, what's the biggest subunit, right? Because if I want to reduce these bars further, I clearly need to focus on which one? The hydrometallurgical processes, right? If I decreased the um, energy consumption of mechanical processing a hundredfold, I would have so little impact on this total number because it's such a small piece of the pie. If I decrease the hydrometallurgical part of this by a hundredfold, I've really done something, right? That's an insight I wouldn't have if I hadn't done this life cycle assessment. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that I think is really useful when you're trying to develop technologies. Is I have all of these optimization efforts I can do, which one is going to be most impactful to my bottom line, okay? So with that in mind, what we found, another thing we found was that electricity and the electricity source, the carbon intensity of the electricity source is, a key, is the key driving factor of the environmental impacts. Um, in particular CO2 emissions. So another way to say that is where you put the battery recycling facility matters a lot because where you put it dictates what the energy mix is, where you are, um, and that dictates the, uh, the CO2 emissions of your process because electricity is a major driver. So these are some of the different um, uh, energy grids around the US and you can see the uh, red one was on this Nevada NEDP. This is the California, um, uh, the California grid, um, the California independent system operator. But this is just going with carbon intensity. So the greener it is, um, the lower the carbon intensity. So that means that this can help you uh, site, tell you where to site batteries and sub recycling facilities. So a little background on that. How did we get to that conclusion? We looked at the contribution to environment, mental impacts of all the steps associated with battery recycling. So we zoomed in on that bar. And again, the, the conclusion is obvious. It's the red part here. It's the electricity part, right? That's the part that is the most influential on our overall environmental impact. Um, uh, stages. Okay, and then with these input electricity sources, we started to see an interesting trade off between CO2 emissions of energy sources that are going up here and water consumption that are going down. So there's an energy water, there's a CO2 emissions water trade off here in terms of uh, electricity mix. Again, this is not something that people had thought about or appreciated. That's a new insight that we we're really excited about. So I mentioned the hydrometallurgy being a huge part of this, right? Um, and that is actually why. We, or that's what made me confident that what we were doing, what we plan to do is useful. Because if I can make lower energy input hydrometallurgical uh, processes, I can make a big difference on battery recycling. So that's what we started to do. Our focus on hydrometallurgical processes has, has centered on uh, selective membranes, okay? If you remember from, I showed you this like, um, not number line, but sort of this like high energy separations and low energy separations, right? We were over here doing evaporation, these sorts of things. Membranes was like right here. Right? So that's the thesis for why we decided to focus on making lithium selective membrane. Very centered in the life cycle assessment. Could I have just said, let's make lithium selective membranes for the fun of it? Yes, that's fun. I have fun with that. It's fundamental, putting the fun in fundamental. But <laughs> now we can also say this is actually really impactful. Right? If, if, we, if, we make, if I'm able to reduce the energy input of the lithium separation in water by tenfold, I know what impact it can have on battery recycling at large. Okay. So crossing length scales, that's the system scale. We're going down into process and molecular scale. Let's talk about membranes. Why aren't there lithium selective membranes today? Or why, why, do, why are our membranes not good at separating lithium out? We have a design for that, right? Most water treatment membranes are in this category of reverse osmosis, right? Reverse osmosis separates water from salt, right? It's how we desalinate seawater. We can desalinate wastewater as well, but it's all based on size. And we use pressure to push water through very small pores in a membrane. If we look at other um, means of selectivity, we can use charge. This is for those of you in the electrolysis space. 
this is like natheon or cation or anion exchange membrane, we can get positive charges through and reject negative charges or the opposite. Sure, that we can buy off the shelf commercially. There are even some uh, valent selective, so even between two cations, something like calcium and lithium, we could separate between. There are some newer membranes that are just sort of affordable for if you're in a lab with grant money. <laughs> to to uh, separate off. But something that I have not seen commercially is something that can be truly ion selective, right? So going back to the thesis about separating lithium from sodium, right? If I want to separate lithium from sodium, I can't do it with size. They have similar hydrated ionic radii. I can't do it with charge. They're both positive. I can't do it with valence. They're both monovalent plus one. I need something else, and that's where our chemical selectivity comes in. That's the frontier we're on. So quantify that a bit just to show you how hard this is. If we're separating lithium and sodium, say, that's a sub angstrom level difference in those two ions. Even if we're doing lithium and nickel, which I'll show you, that's still a sub angstrom level in, in uh, those two ions. Okay, so that's what we're after. That's sort of the holy grail. Uh, I, we, ha we have done a little, we have some cool preliminary results on lithium sodium, but I'm going to focus more on lithium nickel because of the battery leachate story uh, for today. So in terms of what process you would use these membranes in, we're going to use them in an electrochemical process, electrodialysis, where you just have potential applied and you control the movement of charged ions, okay? But most anion exchange and cation exchange membranes today are not ion selective, like I just showed you on the previous slide. What we're trying to do is get lithium through and reject all the other cations, okay? So um, these current IEMs, ion exchange membranes, the general term for either anion or cation exchange membranes. They're quite, so, they're firm selective. They can distinguish between positive and negative charges, but not really between something like lithium and sodium. Okay, just to drive that home. And so why, why do we think that is? There are some fundamental, very molecular scale questions we can ask ourselves uh, and answer in some of our work, where we can think about adding ligands or adding chemical functional groups that will interact preferentially with one of the ions, lithium or the competitor ion. Um, and how we can actually establish design goals. And so the question here is does having a bond between the ion of interest and the membrane, does it accelerate transport or does it hinder transport, right? You can think kind of a thought experiment, you could think about either one, right? It could slow down the lithium moving through, for example, or if you have a whole channel, it could speed it up, right? You could make highways for lithium, so to speak. That's an open question. And then we thought a lot about how does the number of functional groups, you have the number of these ligands or the ligand density in the membrane impact performance as well. So there's a lack of comprehensive data sets here that are comparing these under standardized conditions in the same water, right? I could show you hundreds of papers where they've each looked at one specific water and reported selectivity. But if two papers look at two different wastewaters and they have two different membranes, how do you compare the results? They've changed two, we, we, we're looking at two sets of variables changing, we can't compare them. Um, at least not in a rigorous way. So our research objectives here, and this is a paper that uh, one of my students, Kristen Abels, is preparing now. We prepared a library of ligand functionalized membranes for the controlled study of ion transport as a function of binding affinity, so changing the, the identity of the groups and then changing the content of the groups, how many there are. So here you can think about just the shape is showing quickly a different type of uh, functional group and then just the number, different number of the same functional group. If that makes sense. So you can change the identity or you can change the amount of them. Okay, and we did this for brines and for lithium ion battery leachate as well. So as we make these comprehensive data sets, we can start to establish these relationships between structure and performance, and hopefully get to some design rules so that the next time I or someone else wants to design an X selective membrane where X is an ion, they don't have to start from scratch. That'd be great. Uh, Kristen would like that. So, um, so how do we go about selecting these functional groups or ligands? First, we look at what's in commercial cation exchange membranes. It tends to be sulfonates. And what I'm showing you here are these binding constants. And when I say homogeneous, I mean these aren't reported for membranes. They're reported for just a chemical species A dissolved in water and chemical species B, the ion, dissolved in water. So that's the best we can do in terms of comparing that case and affinity to something in a membrane, which you can imagine has a lot of differences, right? But this is the best we can do in terms of what data sets we have available. So you can see we're taking the difference between the cation of interest and the ligand and getting this binding affinity constant K. So on these number lines, you can see that lithium is here, sodium, magnesium, nickel. I'm going to show you two other number lines. Uh, and what we're looking at is the difference between the two ions on this number line. The bigger the difference, likely the more selective we can get. There's a bigger difference in affinity. So th th there, there's something to distinguish them, okay? We can show you this for carboxylic acid and pyridine. And these are two membranes that uh, Kristen has made. And same color scheme, so I'll just fill these in. But you can see now we can get larger differences based on different functional groups. So I'll show you this pyridine membrane in particular, where we can get a big difference between lithium and nickel. 
you can also notice that some of these bars are wider than other bars, and that has to do with the ratio of functional groups to ions, right? So that's the ligand density um, variable here, right? So if we have more ligand, we can get a, a bigger difference in affinity between nickel and lithium. So in terms of how we fabricate these, and we don't have to go into too much detail here, but in short, we're using these polyethylene glycol backbones, we're mixing them together, and all we're changing out is one ingredient, the monomer. And this is where we add our functional group. So you see this kind of uh, carboxylic acid type of functional group, and we're going from zero to 50%, and then this, and, uh, this four vinyl pyridine here, also going from zero to 50%. Again, we're changing two variables, the identity of the functional group, and then the amount of each functional group. Okay, so two different functional groups, and five different compositions, densities of each group. <laughs> I'm gonna show you just a subset of this, but here's how the workflow goes. Kristen drop casts these membranes, so she makes a, a monomer solution that polymerizes them uh, under light to make these like membrane coupons, and then we do a whole bunch of characterization. We look at the membrane properties, how much water does it uptake, what are its uh, physical dimensions. We look at the membrane uh, chemistry to make sure the functional groups that we think are there are there, to make sure we made what we thought we made, right, before we record it. Um, and degree of polymerization. And then the results I'll show you today are more on the membrane performance. So we have these um, 3D printed reactors where the membrane is right between these clips, and we simply measure the changes in ion concentration over time between the two chambers. Okay. We can also do sorption experiments to look at partitioning and uh, a conductivity of the electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. Okay, so one of the major takeaways from this study so far is that when we look at lithium selectivity, and so this is, these are binary solutions of lithium with sodium, lithium with nickel, lithium with magnesium, okay? We're using chloride because we have to have an anion and we want it to be the same in all cases. And this is a, uh, one of the most common anions in lithium waste products. So if only, um, if only ligand identity were important and ligand content were not important, all of these lines would just look horizontal like this. Right, because what we're changing here is it's all the same four vinyl pyridine uh, functional group, but we're changing how much there is the mole percentage. Okay, does that make sense, everybody? So the fact that we are changing this, and yeah, for sodium and for magnesium there isn't a big difference, but for nickel there's a huge difference. So the major contribution of this study that we've done so far is that most people in most papers would not expect have not reported on the difference that just changing the amount of a functional group in a membrane matters, right? They would compare this for different functional groups, which we have data on as well, but I'm not showing you today for gravity. But this fact that this is a, this is a non-linear, non-flat curve, right, uh, is a huge deal, okay? Well, it's also a huge deal because we've made membranes that are about five, six times as selective as the best commercial membrane we found, okay? And this is, Kristen's doing great, but these are not optimized membranes. Like, um, yeah, let's just put it that way. So there's lots to optimize here. We think we can get this number even higher. That's, that's what I'm getting at. Okay, so part of us is interested in the fact that we need a highly selective membrane, but we're mostly interested in the fundamental design rules that making this membrane has taught us. Okay, so what we've seen is that we can exceed commercial membrane lithium nickel selectivities, and we can do so by controlling how much of the ligand there is. Again, sounds obvious, but in short, we're arguing that the identity of the functional group is a necessary but insufficient descriptor for the performance you can expect. Because if, if just the identity were sufficient, there would be no changes in this graph at all, uh, as we show it. Okay, so, um, and so what we think this is attributed to is the fact that we have a larger ratio of functional groups to the lithium. And so in short, we're making strong, I'm sorry, to the nickel. Um, so we're making stronger bonds between the nickel and these uh, functional groups. That correction I just made is important because in short, what we're doing is we're slowing the nickel down by binding it in the membrane. So the nickel gets stuck in the membrane, the lithium continues on. That's the, that's the mechanism of how we're, how we're achieving that. Okay, and so what we can look at more broadly is that if we look at these ion permeabilities relative to a control ion, uh, to a control membrane, excuse me, lithium and this pyridine are here. These have some of the highest permeabilities, but there are two ways to decrease permeability, right? So this is both attractive, so nickel is attracted to this pyridine, Magnesium is sort of repulsed by it, but both of those will decrease permeability. So this ties into our question that permeability also depends on the ligand content. So this is just showing the nickel slowing down. So this is for nickel. You can see the nickel slows down a lot as we add more uh, of, the, of the functional group. And that's what I mean by nickel slowing down. So it's the lithium permeability or the lithium flux is unchanged 
as for this membrane. What we're doing is slowing the nickel down, not speeding the lithium up. Okay, that that is an important uh, takeaway. So to wrap up this story. And um, yeah, I'm sort of zooming through just so you can sort of appreciate the highlights and happy to answer questions on what's interesting to you all. Is that we found that both weak and strong binding affinities can reduce ion permeability in this graphic. So you kind of the relative maximum is right here at lithium, and then we can decrease it in multiple ways. And we also found that ligand content is an important but underappreciated uh, role, uh, plays an important but unappreciated role in membrane design and performance. Okay, so I want to finish today. Uh, the last uh, chapter here talking about nitrogen. So we've talked about lithium for electrochemical separations. Now I'm going to talk about nitrogen and electrocatalysis. Okay? And nitrogen has many forms, and that's why it's a great um, site to study um, electrocatalysis. So I mentioned nitrate reduction to ammonia. Here's that reaction. So we're going from the most oxidized form of nitrate, all the way of nitrogen as nitrate, all the way down to ammonia. We've also started some work, and others are doing it on ammonia all the way to nitrate. But kind of the vision here, right? As we, as I, as I told you, I'm at this like reflective one year after five years place as a faculty member. One of the things I'm most interested in over the next five years is being able to stop wherever we want along this ladder. Why can't we stop at hydrazine from ammonia? Hydrazine is literally rocket fuel and jet fuel, right? Let's make a really high value product from ammonia. But to do that, we need to run a reaction, but stop it at just one electron transfer. That's going to take a separation and changing of the local environment. Uh, so that's what we're after, but today I'll just focus on nitrate reduction. Okay, so we built this uh, part of our research from some of my PhD work on a technology that uh, Cara and I developed together, my PhD advisor, called electrochemical stripping. So this is a sep an electrochemical separation, but it's also an electrochemical separation process. So what this does is it recovers nitrogen from wastewater based on charge and volatility. So this is just an electrolyzer, if you're used to that, so like water splitting is what it's doing. So there's a titanium-based anode and a stainless steel cathode, and electrons are flowing in this external circuit. So we feed in a wastewater that has ammonium in it. We have sodium chloride dilute in this intermediate cathode chamber. Then we have sulfuric acid in the trap chamber because we're going to make ammonium sulfate, which is a very common liquid fertilizer. So our thesis here, again, is making fertilizer from pure fertilizer from a very impure wastewater. So in this anode chamber, uh, we're going to do a reaction called oxygen evolution that acidifies. I was talking about making oxygen and protons. That's what we're doing here. And when we do that, ammonia NH3 is going to get protonated and become NH4+. We'll separate based on charge here because positively charged ions are going to be attracted to this negatively charged electron. This membrane, you're already familiar with some of these membranes, is a cation exchange membrane that can separate positively charged ions from negatively charged ions. So we separate first based on charge. Now, as you can imagine, there are other cations in the solution. Sodium, uh, uh, potassium, magnesium, calcium, that will also make their way to this cathode chamber. So in short, we need another selectivity factor to be able to get highly pure ammonia out. That second factor we use is a, is a result of the pKa of ammonia. So as we basify this chamber due to hydrogen evolution, which consumes protons or produces hydroxide ions, we deprotonate ammonium back to ammonia. And here's the catch that this ammonia is quite volatile. So ammonia will volatilize, and we trap that ammonia with a membrane that is uh, hydrophobic, so it doesn't let water through, but does let gaseous ammonia through. And that's the volatility part I'm talking about. So ammonia comes across this membrane, gets trapped, and, return, and reconverted into ammonium, because this has a lot of protons in it, this solution, and so we make ammonium sulfate. So lots of reactions and movement here, but in short, we separated based on charge with the first membrane and based on volatility with the second membrane. What allows us to just to um, convert between those two bases for separation is the electrochemical potential that introduces hydroxide ions here. Right. Okay, so uh, enough about how the process works. Let's look at how it actually performs. So these are data from real urine. Um, I told you I was a urine enthusiast. Uh, and again, but now you know why. You remember the pie chart and that hydrolyzed urine is the place to go if you want ammonia for wastewater. Uh, to make that a little more numerical, uh, urine is 1% of wastewater volume, municipal wastewater volume, but it contains 80% of the nitrogen in wastewater. So if I want to go capture nitrogen, I should do what nature has, I should take advantage of what nature does in our bodies, which is separate, highly concentrate nitrogen in one form of our excreta and not the other. Okay, so this mass balance is showing that ammonia is leaving the anode chamber here in green, the first chamber, going through in black, that middle chamber, and ending up in this trap chamber. Okay, so that's show, showing the movement of ammonia. 
We can do this in not just real urine, but in several different other wastewaters. Um, this is hydrothermal liquefaction effluent from like a biofuels plant, anaerobic digester effluent, and also reverse osmosis concentrate. We can do it to the tune of 85-90% recovery efficiency. Now, what I'm not showing you is a ton of selectivity data, but you'll just have to kind of believe me for now that ammonia is the only thing that ends up in the trap chamber. So uh, urine has many, many constituents in it. And when I was a PhD student, I painstakingly measured everyone I could think of. So other, other cations, other anions, organic, uh, uh, organic constituents as well, and also even trace metals, okay? None of those ended up appreciably in the trap chamber, even though they were all present in the wastewater. So what we've done with this is actually one of my students, Anna, who's uh, also about to graduate soon. Anna has taken uh, my PhD work and really done some very practical, very hard experiments. <laughs> so for reference, I use one of these to run, let's say, dozen, a dozen experiments that each lasted one day. Um, Anna said, okay, let's run two of these simultaneously for 40 days. Okay, so she treated urine continuously for 40 days, which no one has done in this way, and even wastewater has not often been treated electrochemically for this long. And what we were after is how are all the ways that it's going to screw up? That was the simple, that's the simplest summary of our study, right? It's like to, to move towards scale up or implementation, we need to figure out the failure modes, okay? And so what Anna did, um, it did fail, but I'm going to show you some of the successes first. What we're able to do here, this, there's a lot of data here, but we have this runtime. So in and of itself, running for 35 and 37 days for these two reactors, huge contribution to the literature. I wasn't sure I could run that long. When we were planning this, we said we're going to run this baby as long as we can, okay? Or until you have to graduate. Um, <laughs> or until, yeah, so it failed first. So that's why it was done, and we submitted this paper. Okay, so um, what we were able to do is this influent ammonia concentration, you can see is down here, okay? So that's a TAN concentration around five, 7,000 or so. That's the normal concentration in uh, urine. But you can see this product concentration, we're able to get much higher. We can concentrate. We're making more concentrated ammonia than came in in the urine. So urine is flowing through. We're grabbing the ammonia out and storing it. And we can concentrate that ammonia several fold, two, three, four, five X. Okay. Now, in terms of removal and recovery, removal is how much of the ammonia we got out of the urine. So that's sitting around the 80% range over 35 days, constantly over 35 days. And the recovery is of that which was removed, how much actually made its way into the fertilizer, around 75%, okay? Now you saw in my first experiments, we were more like 90%, but that was again for 24 hours, right? And it did this for 40 times as long and was able to sustain this performance, which is really critical. One of the other things we found and why this keeps going up and down is that we were experiencing a lot of membrane failure. Membranes would get fouled by what was in the wastewater, so we would need to replace them. Now this spurred on another study, one of my postdocs, Neha, has been really into studying the mechanisms of membrane fouling when a membrane is exposed to wastewater. Now, this has been done for reverse osmosis because reverse osmosis has been scaled up. The solutions to membrane fouling are backwashing, right? You stop everything and flow backwards, or you add acid, okay, to uh, basically regenerate the membranes. What we're looking at now is that in electrochemical systems, you're not pressing things through the membrane, you're more flowing them by, but we need to understand the molecular mechanisms of fouling so that we can then design in molecularly informed mitigation techniques. So that's what Neha's work is on and is in partnership with uh, Synchrotron experts at Slack uh, National Lab right there, Stanford. So I also wanted to highlight Arisa's work. Arisa is a third year PhD student who's wrapping up a paper on, you can see the solar panel here, and if you can really carefully see there's an ECS unit. But she's pairing together solar panels and um, electrochemical stripping, or ECS as we call it. And she had this insight that solar panels often get too hot and their efficiency lowers, right, when they're exposed to the sun. And so there's a need to cool those solar panels. And our process from another study we did, it um, speeds up when the catholite, our middle chamber, gets hotter because you're volatilizing ammonia. The higher the temperature, the more likely ammonia is to come out of the liquid phase and into the gas phase. Arisa saw these two observations and said, these can solve each other's problems. So what she's doing, she's built a flow cell that flows water on the back of the solar panel, okay? It cools down the solar panel, gets it back into its more efficient range. It heats up that water. We use that water, it's the dilute sodium chloride. I'll just show this here just to make this more visual. So we're, we're running, so it's like solar panel over here and that solar panel of cooling fluid, is, it happens to be sodium chloride. And it's this, it's this chamber right here. What this does is speed up this step of the process, which we have found to be rate limiting. Again, biggest piece of the pie versus optimization opportunity. And that's what we were able to do. So Arisa has shown that basically putting a solar panel together with our electrochemical stripping reactor 
it solves two problems at once. So um, I want to make sure I leave time for questions. So I think I will uh, wrap up the nitrogen story there. I th I'll show you one more slide on this just because I think it's important. So I mentioned, so this is all just ammonia recovery, but I mentioned nitrate reduction as well. And one of our key insights and contributions to the literature has been that when you're trying to do reactions in water, many people focus on the catalyst that you make, the solid phase catalyst, because that's what as chemical engineers we often design. Like, ooh, we've made this new fancy catalyst. It's awesome. The environmental engineering training came to the table in chemical engineering. I was like, of course the water matters, right? Like that was almost an obvious conclusion to me, but I didn't see it in the literature as much as I saw emphasis on this catalyst. The pH here will matter, the species concentrations will matter, um, and that will all, both of those influence our observed activity or the rate of the reaction and the selectivity of the product distribution, right? So how much in your mixture of products, how much is made towards your desired product ammonia here. And so we're used to studying in the chemical engineering field, the restructuring of catalysts. The cognate that we've come up with on the liquid side is mass transport and how the water composition way out here influences the water composition that the catalyst actually sees. So I'll show you just one key thing about the electrolyte composition here is that by changing flow rate, Elizabeth and Jin Yu, two of my um, uh, group members, they were able to see that we could really control the pH, and this is pH equivalent because it's modeled, by changing the flow rate by the electrode, we could change the interfacial pH and increase it, right? So the lower the flow rate, the lower the interfacial pH. We then were able to study directly what the interfacial pH was, which is a huge contribution because this is, you can't just put a pH probe next to a catalyst and get the first 10 nanometers of solution, which is what we were able to do with this technique, this IR, uh, this infrared spectroscopy technique. So what we did here is we actually probe that first 10 nanometers by shooting infrared uh, radiation at the catalyst and it goes a little bit into the liquid just for 10 nanometers or so. And then we can look at the differences in um, the absorption peaks of different phosphate species. So H3PO4 phosphoric acid, H2PO4 minus, uh, HPO4 two minus, PO4 three, right? There are four different phosphate species. And because we can measure the differences in those phosphate species, in the bending and stretching of the atoms and bonds in those phosphate species, we can actually back out the interfacial pH based on the pKa calculations, right? If you can get the ratio of two species and you know their pKa, right? For those of you who have taken water chemistry, that's like maybe the question you dread. It's like, tell me what the pH is, right? What is the pH of a solution that contains this? Okay, so we can do that, uh, but actually back out what the interfacial pH is. So the last thing, uh, like um, experimentally, I want to show you is our measurements here. So this magnitude of total current density is not too surprising, this shape here with different applied potentials. What I want you to focus on is this color scheme and this bulk pH. So bulk pH is what we can measure with the pH probe. The bulk pH of the solution was around six, six and a half. At very extreme potentials, the interfacial pH that we measured via the phosphate ratios via infrared spectroscopy is 14, right? So in short, what people have been characterizing as a pH of near neutral is actually a very, very basic pH right near the electrode. And that's where it matters. That's what the catalyst sees. The catalyst doesn't see something that's microns away. It sees something that's nanometers away. So that's what I mean by the electrolyte here is really influencing the performance. So an interfacial pH is much greater than bulk pH. And then what we did is we used this to change how we operate the process. If that is true, and you're alkaline because you're proton limited, you don't have enough protons around, and you want to go from nitrates to ammonia, NO3 minus to NH3, you need a lot of protons around to keep that going. So what do you do? You need to establish mixing to replenish your source, your supply of protons. How do you do that? Sounds simple. It is. You just turn the current off. So that's where pulsed potential electrolysis comes in, right? So you turn it on, you turn it off, you turn it on, you turn it off. Rather than keep it on for a sustained time, you'll be proton limited the whole time. If you go like this, you'll constantly have enough protons. So when we did that pulse potential, we were able to increase the selectivity towards ammonia around 3.5 to four times. We didn't change the catalyst. All we changed was a process operating parameter from a mechanistic insight, all based on electrolyte engineering. Okay, so that's where we're 
come in kind of terms of that. So that's kind of the nitrogen story I wanted to tell you. I wanted to wrap up just again summarizing that these three approaches, electric catalysis, which I showed you, especially the electrolyte side, electrochemical separations. I didn't talk much about acid and base manufacturing, but happy to talk more about that. Just so that you don't think I only think about lithium and nitrogen, which would be fine. Um, here are some other things that we do. We've been producing uh, acid and base, so this is something I left out today, from desalination brine. We've also been miniaturizing some of our electrochemical systems into 3D printed sensors so that we can measure ammonia and nitrate in the environment. Uh, we're working with um, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, and uh, uh, the Moss Landing Marine Labs to be able to actually measure nitrate in their uh, seawater aquaculture system. Uh, Anita's work, uh, so Anita Shaw, she's finishing up her PhD on electrochemical sulfur oxidation. And this became of interest to us because we were trying to make the sulfuric acid that we use to trap ammonia, but from a more renewable source, from a different wastewater. So it's like closing the loop on closing the loop. And then we have some work on phosphate precipitation as well. I would definitely be remiss if I didn't thank my group and several of our funders. This is us about a year ago um, uh, with Lucas, one of our, our core postdocs, who uh, is now a, a PI at a Georgia Tech Shenzhen Institute. And some of the other people I mentioned here, uh, Anna, who ran these champion 40-day experiments, Kristen, who's done a lot of work on uh, lithium, Anita, who's graduating soon, and I also showed Arisa's work as well. Um, so that is the crew and what we do, and I'm happy to take any questions. I think we have 15 minutes left here, so. Yeah. Um, first, I want to thank you for explaining really complex topics in a way that was digestible and super fun to engage with. Um, really appreciate that. And so I have a question about the lithium selective membranes. I'm wondering, um, first, are you inducing an electromagnetic field on the membrane or are you electrically like charging the membrane itself? Good question. And I should have mentioned that. So all the results I showed you were not from the use case of actually applying electric current yet. So those were all just diffusion tests. So let me pull up where I have that. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so these were all, we literally just let lithium nickel solution sit here and a, a pure water solution sit here and we just wait. Great, okay. Um, but we have some results um, on running this with electrochemical potential applied and we can tune the selectivity using, like in short, there's an intermediate current density at which the lithium nickel selectivity is higher than other current densities. Yeah, I was curious to ask because it looked like the polymerized chains you were using were vinyl based um, and then your ligands, again, that you have a very polar molecule. Mm -hmm. And I was curious about the effects of like electromagnetic field induced on a polar molecule mm -hmm. for the sake of directionality. Yeah. Um, and if you can expose the ligand in some way more intentionally to your target molecule with them. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I read a couple of papers with respect to that for a lot with um, dehumidification. Yeah, yeah. And so I was curious if there was kind of an angle to increase selectivity for ions using your ligands with directionality. Yeah, there is. So um, we have decided to kind of um, put our ligands everywhere in the membrane. They're in the bulk. And they're, they're equally distributed around the membrane. Others, um, so I'm thinking of like Rafael Verdusco's group, uh, Rice, they've decided to just functionalize one side like put all the membrane, put all the functional groups at one edge of the membrane, which implicitly has some directionality, right? You, if you go from the back side, it won't be, it, the selectivity will look different than if you go from the front side. Um, so we haven't quite compared notes on that. We, he and I have talked about it uh, with Kristen as well. Um, but yeah, we haven't quite looked at the difference because you can imagine we're probing ligand content, but not ligand distribution right? as, a, as a variable. You can imagine two membranes that have the same mole percentage of a functional group. But there, one is like this and one is everywhere, right? And that's something that's an open question. Good question. The slide you showed um, at, towards the end of the LCA, mm -hmm. study for what Redwood, mm -hmm. um, there would seem like an inverse relation between energy mm -hmm. and water. Yes. Why? Yeah, good question. <laughs> so that has to do with where these. Um, what these mixtures of, where these different electricity grids are getting their energy from. Mm -hmm. um, one of them, some of them have hydropower, right? And so one of the things we include in this as an edge case is if you um, are using water, but you return it to the environment, does it count as water use, right? Mm -hmm. And so we didn't count it. Um, some people might, but that is one of the things that can influence um, the water energy 
out of the water emissions trade off. Um, another, so that's like a cooling water, another example that is cooling water at a power plant. Arguably, that wouldn't count, but then some people who are focused on like thermal pollution might say that does count because you heated up the water and turned it to the environment. Um, but so that's one example. The hydropower is the short answer to why some of these have a uh, variability in like the percentage of hydropower. I have another question. Sure. Um, for when you're feeding in waste water, so you're so your your um, your slide that showed the nice diagram from your page before. What is the concentration of ammonia in the yeah. water? Yeah. Because it's different in different places. And so mm -hmm. are you having to tune the membrane to specific concentrations, or is there a wide range of operational efficiency that a membrane will have? Yeah. And at what point does it just it's like that's ah, too too little or too much, and do we need to pre-process the wastewater and inject something right to adjust it such that it works in the operating conditions that the membrane will be most efficient? Yeah, fantastic question. So these operating regimes of these different processes become really important. So I showed you the names of these wastewaters. There's also a version of this graph where I could just show you the ammonia concentrations. Yeah. Right. So this ammonia concentration is in the thousands. Tends to be five to seven thousand milligrams of nitrogen per liter. Hydrothermal liquefaction effluent is more like in the hundreds, high hundreds to 1,000 range. Anaerobic digestate can vary a lot, but let's say it's in the hundreds range, and RO concentrate is also in the hundreds, can even be lower range. So this shows you that over, and actually we've seen some RO concentrates that are like really low actually, um, like tens. Uh, so in short, I could have also said about this graph, this is showing robustness over three orders of magnitude of ammonia concentration. So you mentioned that your team is working with other countries like Kenya, for example. Um, and I was curious, I'm part of a student org that nationally there are some projects in Kenya um, and they're on water, water quality systems. Um, and it's always tricky to make sure that they're maintained properly. And so I was curious, what do you think the use case is for a membrane technology for selectivity there versus something that's maybe easier to maintain like an aerobic digester? Yeah. Um, and how do you kind of ensure that these technologies and equipments are being maintained the way that they should to get the productivity that you're looking for. Yeah, our way into that has been very much through partnerships. So most of our community work, if well, all of it is partnership based, but much of it in Sub-Saharan Africa is with research institutes in the area um, and with companies like startups and the social enterprise startups in the area. So we often view ourselves and my students are often curious about this. I view the best partnership or like our role is not actually like building toilets, uh, but taking the urine from toilets that have been installed, right? And so what that allows us to do, so we've worked with a company called Sanergy. Um, they're, it's now the Sanergy Collective and they have different um, subsidiaries. Um, but I started working with them as a PhD student. But what was exciting, mutually exciting there was that they were building toilets and they happened to choose source separating toilets to separate urine from feces. Why? Because they knew there were some feces treatment technologies that all required drying out feces. So they were just gathering thousands of liters of urine and didn't have anything to do with it, right? So I worked in Kenya because it was easier to get thousands of liters of urine there than in Berkeley. Um, uh, so that's, that's like, I mean, I love working in Kenya and like they had the good stuff. As they were there. <laughs> that's a lot of urine there, right? Uh, but what that meant is that like, I, I, I view our approach as very like, it tends to be back end, right? So like if there's, if there's user facing, like building toilets and user experience, a partner that does that is it was a great partner complement to what we do, which is like you've collected all this urine and we're trying to uh, balance your books a little bit by, by uh, creating revenue from something that you're paying to get rid of. So that's where we came in. And so then, yeah, they have staff, operating staff that we then trained on how to do this, but it wasn't like a, a household, a person in a household has to treat their own urine and figure out how to run a membrane system. But I think what that ties into is like, What's the optimal scale for some of these things? Is it at, and there we decided not to do every toilet level. We decided to do it at the collection facility for multiple reasons. You have to build fewer of them. The, you don't need as many operators, right? And there's some economies of scale, go back to your point. Semi-centralized is often a great place to be, right? You have tens or thousands of liters. You don't have to make one of these for every toilet. Yeah. But that's a question that's like very, takes years to figure out, honestly. And it's context. 
I had one from a while ago. I have one question. Yeah, go for it. Uh, my question was uh, in general about uh, lithium extraction technologies because you were talking about uh, lithium extraction from oil field brine and recently ExxonMobil like touched into that space and yeah. there's, uh, they're going to be extracting lithium. I wanted to know, are they using a conventional technology or is this something new? And if, if they're extracting it from uh, oil field brine, then is there something in common with your research? Yeah, great. Um, great question. Um, my understanding is that they're using uh, conventional technologies. Um, or let's say existing technologies. And for lithium extraction, there are adsorbents, ceramic adsorbents that have been developed by a few key companies. I think Exxon is partnering with one of those companies that are, then those exhibit lithium selectivity. They work kind of like battery electrodes. They intercalate lithium into a, into a 3D interface, a 3D uh, hard material, and then the lithium comes in and out based on adsorption. Okay. Um, so there are several startups in this space that are doing lithium extraction that way, and I think that's kind of the leading edge of lithium selective technologies. Making a solid state matter. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just was curious about um, I saw in your earlier slides about um, geothermal brands, because I know that the state of California has sort of like dollars into um, extraction of lithium brands uh, down. Is, is the do you know the technologies they're exploring are similar to this? Because I, I think there's a membrane based technology. I just was curious. Yeah, I think in the salt and sea, some of those same adsorbents. And often, I, I should also have this when people are there are membrane technologies being used, but they're usually commercial membranes or adaptations yeah. of like nano filtration membranes. So it's something based off of size and then a little bit based off of charge. But in terms of the, I guess another way to say it is they often require substantial pretreatment because they don't have true ionized lithium. Yeah, and I mean, this is just a follow on it. I, I just, I look at the amount of waste material they're going to generate in terms of there. Um, and is that related to the, to the fact that they're basically taking out lots of stuff from the brine and then they only want a little exactly, bit of it? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so like calcium, magnesium, or Exactly, they're going to have these two piles. Exactly, yeah. 100x, 1000x concentrations of lithium. This would be like a, Doing a better membrane technology could, could actually reduce yeah. a lot of that waste generation. Yes, yeah, yeah. As a separation person, I often look really closely at the order of how things are separated out yeah. because that tells you what we can and can't do. So in battery recycling, lithium is often left as the yeah. last thing, which immediately tells me we don't have good lithium separation technologies. If we did, it would be a threat. Mm -hmm. and a similar thing is true in some of our conversations with um, with Exxon. In fact, they've been focused on uh, like removing all the water. So that removing as much water as possible so you have a concentrated stream, then removing as much calcium magnesium so that again lithium is left over, right? So they're, what they're doing is they're separating calcium magnesium, which are divalent, and larger from lithium, which is monovalent. And they're leaving, so they're making arguably calcium magnesium selective processes and leaving the lithium behind. Yeah, um, so the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the graph that you showed with um, Kara, is it, no, it's not Kara, that's your, but it was the student that was mm -hmm. ran, ran, the uh, yes, this one, yeah. Um, so you mentioned that the membrane break down. What mm -hmm. are the failure modes of the membrane when it broke down? Was it always the same? Was it different? And then based on the types of failure modes that you saw, mm -hmm. What are the ways to increase the longevity or durability of the membrane? Yeah. And does that require reducing the efficiency of, of capture yeah. or adjusting maybe the actual composition of it? So maybe instead of a single stage, you're having to do multiple stages in order to maintain durability. Yeah. Membrane. Fantastic question. So these two membranes here, right, are the two that could foul or could fail. Um, we replaced in the graph I just showed we were just talking about, we replaced this membrane four, five, six times over the 37 days. We replaced this membrane once. So part of that is that part of that is insightful and part of that is not surprising. Uh, this membrane is doing the hard work of always seeing real urine pass by it. Yep. This membrane sees a nice clean sodium chloride solution with some divalence mm -hmm. at a high pH. So it does have some challenges, but not as many as, as this one faces. Most of the challenges were associated with inorganic fouling on uh, sorry, on this side of the membrane. So we have high pH here. If you have magnesium, you can precipitate magnesium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, uh, the chloride species as well. 
So most of the, the fouling was inorganic scaling on this side of the membrane. Okay. So um, what we're teasing apart now with Neha, one of my postdocs uh, that I mentioned, is, doing, is teasing apart the exact speciation and distribution of those different species here. And one thing we can do, for example, is control the pH here. Maybe we can get up to pH 13 here, but maybe pH 11 and 13 are quite similar in terms of the molecular form, but they're quite different in terms of fouling. Right? So that's where we start to get to the trade outs now you can navigate the benefit of only recovery from the cost of, of fouling and membrane lifetime. Right? Yeah. And then membrane lifetime comes in into our cost calculations because however long this lasts, or if you think about it, you either have to buy one membrane or six to run for 40 days. And so if you think about pieces of the pie, the membranes are a big part of the cost. So are the electrodes here. So we're also looking to lower cost electrodes. Okay. Oh. Okay. Do we still have one more? Yeah. I am um, still figuring out this question, as I said. But, um, <laughs> And I know you focus on, let's say, well, wastewater, and, and I'm thinking about uh, municipal wastewater and all the things that are inside it. Um, so what I'm saying is you, you kind of focus on the end of the, the line and trying to recover everything from that you know, waste product. Um, is there a role for upstream system design mm -hmm. to make your job easier, at least in the municipal uh, wastewater um, you know, policy or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Are there things that you see there that are like, this would be easy to avoid for being here? Yeah, yeah, very much so. So um, often we are sort of at the tail end of the wastewater treatment line, but not always. So one thing we can do, I mentioned like magnesium and calcium here. One of the things we've explored is pretreatment before, if you remove the magnesium and calcium, you remove the biggest risk of fouling here, right? So you could just have an ion exchange resin that captures magnesium and calcium for this technology. And that would solve a lot of problems, for example. Um, another thing we've done is actually use electrochemically produced acid and bases to regenerate ion exchange adsorbents. And that all happening is pretreatment before reverse osmosis, because reverse osmosis is also fouled by some of those same ions, right? So I view it less as like we're at the end and what needs to come before. And it's just, honestly, I just view them as boxes that you move around, <laughs> that you move around based on the composition coming in. So like as another, as, as an example, one of the reasons that I didn't need to worry about calcium magnesium when I first developed this, I got lucky because I, because I was a urine enthusiast. But one fun thing about urine <laughs> is that calcium magnesium spontaneously precipitate out of hydrolyzed urine. So I never had a fouling problem in any of my experiments because there was like a natural treatment that happened. If you just let urine sit in a bottle, if you're into it, <laughs> I had let urine sit in a series of bottles. And over time, you just start to form receptors. You form ammonia, right? And some of these other cations like magnesium, uh, calcium can precipitate with the phosphate and carbonate that's highly concentrated in urine. So that's why I never saw a fouling problem. So I'm generalizing your question a little bit to say like, the challenges that come from a given wastewater are very specific to that wastewater. Mm -hmm. And if you, you pre-treat a wastewater, maybe it becomes like a different waste, wastewater one becomes wastewater two if you remove some things from it. So it's all about the ordering of the boxes. Thank you. Thank you.